Good evening. Good evening. We're going to get started in just a moment. Can I ask, however, we have, a, we have a massive crowd here tonight, which is fantastic. If there is a spare seat in your aisle, if you could squeeze in, um, give up those valuable aisle seats that I know you've coveted all night, um, and then the latecomers don't have to be quite as awkward when they sneak in late. Thank you so much for that. Because we do have a packed house night. I think we're going to have barely a seat free, which is fantastic. Great speakers drawing a great crowd. So without further ado, welcome to Briz Science for November 2019. I am your host, Dr. Joel Gilmore. Briz Science is hosted by the University of Queensland, where we aim to bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research with you at our monthly free public lecture series. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. And also a big shout out to The Edge, where we're meeting tonight, which uh, is our wonderful venue partner, and do check out all the other fun activities they have here, including their wonderful Maker's Lab downstairs. A couple of bits of housekeeping. If you have a phone, make sure it is set to silent. But also, we will be live tweeting throughout the night. So do feel free to get involved in that. Hashtag Briz Science. And you can also catch up afterwards on some of the highlights there. We will be having food and drink after the talk. Um, I'm not sure whether it'll be quite up to the standard that Heather is going to be talking about tonight. But we're going to do our absolute best. And that'll be a chance for you to ask some more questions of our speaker, as well as, of course, we'll be taking questions at the end, both through question slips that you might have picked up on the way in, as well as through uh, Twitter. So hashtag Briz Science. Again, you can ask your questions there, and we will go through at the end of the talk as many of those as we can. All right, so without further ado, tonight we are talking about Australian cuisine and what makes Aussie food Aussie and how we can capture those flavours and how businesses can harness the Australian originating foods. And to help us with that tonight, we have the fantastic Dr Heather Smythe from the University of Queensland. And Heather is a flavour chemist and sensory scientist, meaning she explores everything from the physiology of how chewing behaviour affects flavour through to assessing textures and flavours through models and instruments. Her research projects currently include beer, wine, coffee, cocoa, tropical fruits, and some snack foods, which she assures me is not just a way of putting in a really great tax return at the end of every year. To tell us about the best of both food and science, please welcome Dr. Heather Smythe. Joel, thank you for that introduction. Can you all hear me on this little gadget here? You can't? I'm only to talk a little bit louder. Is that better? How's that? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very kind introduction. I do sound pretty awesome if I do say so myself. <laughs> However, I'm actually very humbled to see so many faces come along tonight. I, I, I heard when it was sold out, I thought it must be a much smaller venue than I thought. But no, it's not. There's lots of you. Thank you so much for coming, coming to hear my presentation. I hope you're not disappointed. Um, before I start, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land that we meet, the Yagra and the Turrbal people, and pay my respects to their ancestors and descendants alike. So what in the world is a, uh, a flavour chemist and a sensory scientist? Well I, well, I hope to give you a bit of more enlightenment on, on that tonight. Um, to be honest with you, I never knew as a, as a kid going to, to high school and even to university that this was even a job. <laughs> and I have to say, I do love my job. I think it's, um, I think it's pretty special. And um, I, I think, yeah, I think if I'd known as a young person um, that this sort of job existed, then maybe, uh, who knows, maybe I would have, would have tried Harder to get to this spot, I'm not sure, but I, I hope that other, other students and young people out there who are doing science um, might actually consider a career in, in flavour science and in sensory science, because we certainly need more people in this area. So today, yes, I'm talking about um, a sensory experience of Australian flavour. So let's see that my mouse works here. Uh, just to give you a, a bit of a background to my career path, if you wondered how I ended up getting here, 
I actually did uh, a Bachelor of Science at the University of Adelaide, and I, my honours year was actually in synthetic organic chemistry. I spent lots of time in labs with test tubes, making things and building different sorts of chemicals and looking at reactions. And when I finished that PhD, while I was very good at chemistry, I enjoyed it, I felt it kind of lacked a real application to the, to the wider world, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And uh, later that year, after finishing honours, I, um, I saw a PhD being advertised in wine flavour chemistry, and I thought, yeah, <laughs> that's for me. <laughs> So I went and studied that, and, and it was with the University of Adelaide, but also with the Australian Wine Research Institute, and it was really quite amazing to be able to use my knowledge of chemistry and then apply it to the sensory properties of wine and the human experience of wine, and then to try and understand what it is that we enjoy about wine and what's the, the composition. And that really does sum up my career, uh, basically, ever since. It's that kind of exploration. Um, after doing that, I moved up to Queensland, somewhat begrudgingly with my husband's work, um, uh, but ended up landing a job very quickly at the Department of, of Agriculture. It was actually DPI back then and then changed names about six times between then and, and when I left in, in 2010, I moved to the University of Queensland and um, I'm currently a senior um, research fellow. And the group that I work with is called Quaffy. And it's very hard when I did the Coffee Coffee project to explain to people what it was that I was doing. But it's the Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation. And um, uh, at that time, the Queensland government put, made an investment into the university and moved a lot of, of government staff out of um, Department of Agriculture. And um, we've certainly grown since then. Um, Coffee's got four different groups within that institute as part of University of Queensland and I'm in the Food and Nutrition Group or otherwise known as CNAFs. And this is kind of a, a boring schematic about what CNAFs relates to overall and my colleagues in my group do. Um, but I'm certainly over on the interesting side looking at food products and the sensory properties. Sometimes I consider um, the nutritional properties and how that relates to sensory properties as well. Sometimes I'm looking at food ingredients and how that can be used in food systems. Um, and sometimes I'm looking at, at, at animal products and, and feed for animals as well. But, but generally, I'm definitely at the, the fork and health uh, side of things rather than the, the farm end of the equation. So these are, these are a number of different, I guess, photos from studies that I've, I've done over the many years that I've been a flavour scientist. And, um, and it really is an amazing job. I get to taste the best food of the most interesting types. Um, from oysters and prawns, um, a whole lot of interesting fruit and vegetables that have been grown with enhanced nutritional properties like that high anthocyanin and black strawberry up in the top there. Um, there's also some wild rices that were collected from swamps in northern Queensland, um, which is a really unique type of rice. Um, there's beer down there as well. Um, there's coffee. Um, I also look at a whole lot of model food systems where we look at how particular ingredients in a food, um, but we put them in a, a model matrix, how those ingredients might impact flavour and taste sensations or texture sensations uh, more specifically. But so that's just a bit of an overall snapshot. But tonight, I've, I've divided my presentation into three neat little packages, so I can take a little breath in between. First of all, I want to introduce you to your senses, um, your sense of smell and taste and all of the other senses you use to assess food and help you understand a little bit more about you and how exciting the area of sensory science is. I then want to talk about food provenance, and I'll explain a bit more, more what that means, but I do a lot of work for a lot of companies at the moment who are interested in provenance for their Australian-grown food products. And then lastly, I want to talk to you about one of our projects that we have, which is a, a five-year project we've just recently been awarded that's actually looking at um, indigenous um, plant foods specifically and looking at opportunities there to enhance the value of uh, otherwise Australian produce. So, the human senses to get started. So, when we come to assess a food product, there's a number of things that we experience. Obviously, the look of the food, the visual aspect is important. Um, the sound that a food makes, so how crunchy an apple sounds in our ears, will actually impact how fresh we think the apple is. In studies they've done where they've muted the sound, um, and then you, you eat the same apple, you actually think it has a reduced freshness because you can't hear as much crunch. The sound is actually reasonably important. Um, then we have taste sensations. I'll expand on those in a moment. 
trigeminal sensations, which you may not have um, heard of previously. That's through our trigeminal nervous system. Um, things like heating of chili and cooling of menthol. And then there's te texture and tactile sensations also through the trigeminal um, nervous system. And of all of these, um, I guess together, collectively, we could call them, they give us the flavour experience of food. Sometimes just aroma and taste together are used as a flavour, I guess is a word to describe both of those. But across all of these different sensory properties that we use to assess food, there are cross-modal effects. So if we're eating some different coloured jellies, for instance, I, I play this trick, you'll, never, you'll know this one now if you ever come to one of my workshops, but I usually take a pineapple jelly and I make it three different ways. I'll dye one green and I'll dye one um, bright red. And I give it to some, some people and say, well, what do you think, what's the flavour of the, oh, that's raspberry in the red one, yep, raspberry and the green one, there's definitely lime, it's lime flavoured and then the yellow one, oh, yep, that's pineapple. When in actual fact, they all taste exactly the same. So our brain collects all of this information together and then interprets flavour and taste and the sensory properties to, to even tell us whether or not we like something and what we think it's like. So those cross-modal effects must be um, considered when we're doing sensory evaluation. Aroma, olfaction. So this is where my entry was, certainly in the wine field, and our sense of, our sense of olfaction um, is actually pretty amazing. So at the back of our throats, up, up high behind our navel passage, um, is a, a little patch of skin, a little yellow patch of skin, about one centimetre squared, and that's covered with all of, these, um, all of these little receptors. And that's called our olfactory epithelium, and that's where our sense of smell actually originates. That's where we're, dete we're detecting smell. We just detect smell two ways. One of those is, or, is orthonasal. So when we're smelling something here, the volatiles go up through our nose, attach to that olfactory epithelium, send messages to brain uh, and tell us what the smell is. Retronasal is when we have the food in our mouth and we're chewing a food and those volatiles go up the back of our throat, again attached to that olfactory epithelium and give us our sense of smell. Have you ever had coffee with your nose blocked? and you taste the bitterness, but then when you release your nose, then the coffee flavours all arise. And that's because you're allowing that passage of air and those volatile compounds which cause aroma to actually trigger our sense of smell. Our sense of smell is pretty special, I think, compared to our, our sense of taste because there are literally thousands of different types of stimuli that our brain can recognise instantly according to our sense of smell. And scientists don't fully agree on what the mechanism is for those receptors in terms of, um, of how those receptors work in interpreting smell messages in the brain. And, um, and personally, I find that pretty extraordinary. And there are certain types of volatile compounds that we're extremely sensitive to that float around food and, and go up into our nasal passage and other ones which we're not sensitive to at all. And, and that is also quite fascinating to me. Um, our aroma sensation is um, controlled in our brain by a brain structure called the limbic system, and, um, which includes that olfactory bulb, and it supports a number of funct functions other than olfaction or smell. It also looks after emotion, it looks after behaviour, motivation and long-term memories. And this is why often when you smell a smell, you can remember a time or a place or it brings you back to grandma's kitchen or a time you went camping or some other, some other time in space because a sense of smell and our memories are quite, uh, quite closely um, related in terms of and how our brain interprets them. Also, that, that sense of emotion that we have with smell, which is why aromatherapy is so effective, um, we have a very strong emotional response um, to smells, but also to, to food aroma. Um, so it really is a critical part of, of food quality. Taste is also very interesting, but I get more excited about smell, quite frankly. The five basic tastes are salt, sweet, bitter, sour, and umami, and um, there are some taste scientists who would say there's also a fatty taste that we can, that we can sense. There's a little bit of literature about that. I'm not completely convinced of, of that yet. Um, so, so, but basically, those are the five basic tastes that, that we can detect. Now, on our tongues, if you ever looked at that in the mirror, we have these things called fungiform papillae, which are those large structures, kind of mushroom-shaped structures on our tongue. And all the taste buds are housed in those fungiform papillae. 
And so a lot of my panellists and, and people that I, that I work with, um, I look, take photographs of their tongues and we count the fungiform papillae. And taste scientists know, sometimes we put some blue dye on it, as sort of shown in my image up there. So put some blue dye to help you know, accentuate the different, um, the different structures on the tongue. And the more fungiform papillae that you have, the higher density of those fungiform papillae, the more likely you are to be a super taster. That's someone who's particularly sensitive to bitterness specifically. Um, if you have a less dense fungiform papillae, you might be a, a regular taster, and if you have very few fungiform papillae with those taste buds on them, you may be a non-taster. Um, super tasters are, are fabulous, but they're also extremely sensitive to, to some tastes, and sometimes when they are sensory panellists, they're a little bit difficult to work with because they're quite fussy about the intensities of some of the things that we present to them. Um, there's also a phenomenon that we know well in the literature uh, called sweet likers and sweet dislikers. And in that experiment, we actually present solutions of increasing um, sweet um, stimulus concentration. And if you keep rating that you like the increasing concentration more and more and more and more, then you're a sweet liker. But if the sweeter something becomes, the less and less and less and less you like it, then you must be a sweet disliker. Uh, so that's also another uh, phenotype or another way that we can split populations in understanding how your sense of taste impacts um, your appreciation of food. Uh, so trigeminal perception, another part of our brain structure that looks after that. Um, our trigeminal perception detects pungency of ginger, hotness of chilli, and the cooling of menthol in the mouth. It also um, is responsible for knowing the temperature of products that are in the mouth, how hot or cold they are. Um, touch position, the location of the product in the mouth, so sharp chips, for instance, spiking, spiking you, that's been picked up by your trigeminal um, nervous system. And also pain uh, and any other um, sort of hotness that might be in the mouth that's causing, um, causing um, something to feel unpleasant. Uh, so that's our trigeminal perception. Again, that's working with taste and it's working with aroma and gives us that overall sense of um, appreciation of food. Something, when we come to talk about texture, and really, uh, texture is the last frontier for sensory scientists. It's the thing we know the least about, um, but some of my clients who, who work in the beverage industry, let's just say that, say that the texture of some of their beverage products makes up 80% of the purchase decision um, for their consumers, which is actually quite enormous. So that mouthfeel of those products, the weight and density of that product in the mouth is absolutely critical. It's not just the taste and the aroma. Um, it's actually the, the mouthfeel and the textual properties that really do dictate preference. Now, the thing with texture is that it's not this, uh, this one-dimensional thing. It's not just... Um, it, it's a moving target, let's put it that way, for the sensory scientists. And, and I'm not sure if you can quite um, understand what this figure is saying here on the left here, but over here we have the first bite. And let's pretend it's a biscuit or something like that. We start chewing it and there are nice large parts of the biscuit that are moving around our mouth and a little bit of saliva. As we chew, more saliva gets added and the, particle, the particles as we're chewing start to break down. As we go, more saliva um, amalgamates some of those particles and turns them into a soft bolus. And finally, we have one bolus that's ready to swallow. So the textual experience of that product changes as we consume it. Might start off dry and crumbly and hard at the start, but towards the end it's probably pasty, maybe a little bit gritty, slippery or smooth, who knows, and then we swallow and we even have aftertaste sensations. So when I'm trying to measure texture with my panel, it's really important that I keep in mind that it is actually something that's quite dynamic. And on the other side here, I won't go into this one too much detail, but this really is um, over, over the last six years, we've been doing a lot of work looking at soft foods like yogurt or custard, these types of things. And the sensory experiences change quite dramatically as we consume that product. The thickness and smoothness is what we detect first. Then if there's any chalkiness or powderiness, we start to detect those sensory properties. Then we, when we're getting ready to, to swallow, um, any teeth stick or bitsiness becomes obvious. And after we've swallowed, if there's oiliness, um, mouth coating, any drying or astringent properties, are normally detected then. So different sensory textual properties are experienced throughout that oral process, or mastication is the other word we use for it. 
And that one spins around. I didn't realise I did that. Here we go, <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> Should have checked that one. Okay, the other really interesting thing about texture is and it's something that we've learned just in, in recent years, is that everyone uses their mouths differently. We believe that 30% of us are crunchers. I'm a cruncher, I'll admit it, I'm a cruncher. Some of us are chewers, we prefer to chew food. Some of us are smushers, that's where we use our tongue and the roof of our mouth, and we don't really bother chewing at all, we just smush the food with our tongue before we swallow it. And then we have suckers. Now, are you a sucker? So maybe you can relate to one of these different types of groups here. Um, but we also believe there are two more, uh, two more groups that are sort of tiny. There's those who want food in their mouth for the shortest time possible. I think they should be called inhalers. You know, <laughs> giant men with big mouths who just swallow handfuls of chips without even, without even crunching them. And then there's another group called the fiddlers who like to fiddle with things in their mouth. They probably chew pens a lot or their fingernails, I'm not sure. Uh, but they like to fiddle with food uh, and use them in their mouth. So as you can imagine, not only does the process of chewing food change the sensory properties, but if I split you all into your different groups here, you're all having different sensory experiences because of the way you use your mouth. And that, of course, makes texture pretty complicated to be able to analyse in the lab. So one of the things that we like to do is we like to measure all of the different physiological properties of, of human beings that we have tasting things. And um, here we are, um, this is we're counting the fungiform papillae, um, we're measuring the temperature of the mouth. Up here I'm actually counting the number of chews, videoing myself or other consumers who are coming in, counting the number of chews that I make before swallowing, how fast I chew things. Um, we also get to understand, we can fill out a little questionnaire to know whether they're a cruncher, or a sucker, or a smoosher, or, or, or whatever. And I also use another interesting little test which hasn't been around, um, hasn't been used widely really for that long. Um, and it's, it's called the Essex Letter Test, where we have these little Teflon strips with a letter embossed on the end of them. And the letters range inside from two millimetres, which is really quite tiny when you think about it, up to about eight millimetres in size. And here I have one in my tongue, we put a blindfold on our, on our victim, I mean, a participant, a participant, <laughs> who's given informed consent, by the way. Um, so we get them to feel that little strip on the end of their tongue and we get them to tell us what the letter is that they can feel. And some of our more amazing sensory panellists can actually detect and identify 48 letters presented in randomised order in a row at two millimetres in size. This tip of our tongue is absolutely amazing. It's far more sensitive than the tip of our fingers, let's put it that way. And, um, uh, my own experiences of that, of that particular test is when I'm feeling something that's quite small, it actually feels really big. And the first time I did that test, I was quite embarrassed because I thought, oh my gosh, these are all eight millimetres or bigger. This is a huge, I can, this is so embarrassing. Here I am a sensory scientist and I can't feel a thing. I have to have the biggest letters presented to me. Only then can I tell. But in actual fact, they were the really little ones. And the tongue in my brain felt like it had expanded the size of this letter. Um, so that's, I found that quite exciting when I found out I'm actually good at the test. Nevertheless, that's the weird things we're doing there to people. The other really interesting thing about texture and something we're only starting to learn more about is the role of saliva. Now, I have to admit, when I first started working with saliva, this is after working with premium seafood and wine and coffee and chocolate and all of those things for years, I thought, this is disgusting. <laughs> I never thought I'd lower myself to be looking at saliva and measuring saliva and thinking about saliva, I want to gag. But in actual fact, fact I've, I've learnt a new appreciation for my own saliva and I think it's actually pretty amazing. Do you know that, uh, that um, there are, there's a condition that you can have where you don't produce enough saliva? And um, those, pe those individuals are actually quite sick because it's very hard to chew and, and swallow food when you don't have saliva. And scientists and, and um, medicos have tried to come up with artificial saliva solutions, but the reality is they simply cannot mimic the true um, properties, physical properties of human saliva, which is pretty amazing, considering that it's less than half a percent solids, all of the rest of it's water. Um, dilute viscoelastic polymer solution. If you're a, a chemical engineer, that's what you'd call it. It's quite amazing. It can be really stretchy and thin or it can, uh, stretchy and thick. 
it can be watery, it can be all sorts of different types of saliva. It depends on which, which of the glands actually produce that saliva. Um, the flow rate of saliva, rested saliva, is about 0.32 mils per minute, but it really does range. Some of us are producing much more than that. Some of us are producing very little. I think it's about half a litre of saliva that we produce in a day, produce and swallow. And they tell me that you don't produce, well, the papers tell me that you don't produce any saliva at night. Um, however, I think the puddle on my pillow tells me <laughs> that, that I'm producing at least a little bit now and then. So let's just, let's just put that out there. We can increase the rate of our saliva production if we um, uh, stimulate saliva with an, an acid. So if we eat some lemon or, or have an acidic drink, um, we tend to produce more saliva, and that saliva is more stringy and thick and um, uh, then, then our regular rested saliva. We can also increase um, our saliva production when we start to move our mouth. So chewing gum um, or just chewing food, our saliva production increases to help us chew and swallow that food. The functions of saliva, this is actually from a dental um, report. Um, there's so many different amazing functions of saliva. A lot of it actually protects our mouths and our oral tissues, like our, like our, um, our teeth. It protects them and pH buffers them from any um, food that we're eating. But it has, a, in terms of the sensory, it certainly has a really important role in clearing food and aiding in swallowing. It also starts digestion. Um, so really, it is at the very top of our entire digestive system. And alpha amylase is the most abundant um, enzyme that's produced in saliva. And it literally starts to break down um, products in our mouth before they even get, um, get to our stomach. The food starts to break down. And that in itself can have an impact on the, the texture of something that's in our mouth, which is quite interesting. The other important role of saliva in terms of our sensory function is that it dissolves um, tastants from food and allows those tastants to be received by those taste buds which are on our fungiform papillae. It, it dissolves those tastants, the sweet or the salty or the bitter compounds, and transfers them to, to those receptors. So if you're not producing much saliva, your sense of taste is actually inhibited somewhat um, because the saliva isn't there to translate those, those tastes through. This is the second part of, of my um, talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about food provenance. Uh, so I work with a whole range of different food companies from around Australia. And um, you know, when you think back uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, one of the real marketing edges, I suppose, that Australian food products have had is that we produce clean and green foods. Um, so that our environment is pristine, we've got these lovely waters and, and, and ground, which is relatively pollutant-free, and, um, and countries, certainly export countries, appreciate our food products because they can trust them, they know that they're safe, they're not likely to have heavy metals in them or other chemicals or hormones or whatever the case might be, and that we are able to, to um, use that as a marketing message for Australian food products. But more recently, many companies have come to me and said, well, not only is Australia clean and green, but New Zealand is clean and green, and other companies are able to clean up their act, if you like, and also be able to pro provide and produce clean and green food products. So really, we need a different marketing message for Australian products to say why the food that we grow here is awesome and why it's distinct from food that you can get anywhere else in the world. Um, before I, before I go too, too much further on that, I'll explain to you what food provenance means. Provenance, um, it's a bit of a, a sexy term at the moment that you may, may have heard if you go to, rev, uh, to restaurants or whatnot, um, they talk about the provenance of the food products. Provenance comes from the French word provenir, and, and normally uh, that means to come from. And normally that word has been associated with artworks or um, artefacts of, of different descriptions. And it really is sort of a, a story of where the artwork, who painted the artwork, who handled the part artwork there, who they sold it to, which families may have held onto that artwork for periods of time, what museums it may have been displayed in, until the current owner can actually have the nice piece of paper to say, the provenance of this artwork, which is 600 years old, I've got all of that details here, and that's the story of where this artwork came from, how it's been dealt with, and this is why I know it's the real thing, it's original, it's rigididge, and it's worth this because of that provenance story. So that's what provenance really means when it comes to food as well. Consumers are interested to know 
where their food has come from, was it sustainably grown, is it free from chemicals, were any animals hurt in the production of this chicken, was the, uh, <laughs> was, were, you know, any hormones have been used, were, you know, slave children used to produce my coffee, um, those, types of, those types of stories are what consumers are really interested, modern consumers are interested in, to know about the food that they're eating, they're becoming more educated, they want to know the provenance of their, their food product. Um, and provenance in food implies this food origin, as I mentioned, the safety, but also it implies quality attributes. And that's what I want to expand on a little bit further um, in terms of regional flavours. Now, the wine industry have done this very well for, for quite a long time. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we buy wine um, based on region in Australia or, or French wine or, or other regions, and we have an expect expectation that there's certain flavours that are present or terroir that might be present in that, um, it's another French word, um, that actually signifies flavours that are present in those products um, that are derived from the origin, from the, the source, the environment in which that particular food product was grown. And, and that, that regional flavour really is, enhances part of that provenance story in that the producer of that food can say, these are the flavours that are present here, and it's that, that comes from the unique environment in this area in New South Wales or Queensland, or the case, wherever the case may be, that these flavours are unique to our region, and it certainly ties the consumer and that provenance story right back to the, to the region that it's come from. And that is a marketing proposition that can't be competed with by New Zealand, can it? Because only the Barossa Valley is in Australia, only Queensland has Queensland food. Uh, and that really is why um, this is becoming very exciting for food companies. So these flavour volatiles, you ask me, where do they come from in food? These are the ones that we're experiencing retronasally and orthonasally. Um, so uh, these flavour compounds in food, I might actually go to the next slide actually, let's think about wine as a good example. So wine is, is mostly water with a bit of alcohol and then a bit of sugars and acid depending, um, depending on the variety and some colours and tannins if it's a red. But the flavour component of wine, the aroma component, is less than 1% in, in the wine. And we know that across all the different wine varietals that we have measured by, as chemists, that there are more than 800 different volatile components um, that have been measured across wine that are present in that less than 0.1%, which is really tiny. But those flavour volatiles are quite heavily impacted, as I said, by the environment in which the, the grape has been grown and the precursors that were caused and the way that that product has been treated since, how it was fermented, how it was bottled, how it was aged, to actually release those particular distinctive flavours that come, um, at, that originate because of where that particular product has been grown. Something interesting about um, plant foods, and, and I think this is a, a really important point, and I remember reading this, this review many years ago and thinking, hey, that's, that's really something. In plant foods, those volatile compounds that are present are sensory cues of health and nutritional value in that product. They're actually the essential, um, or the, the flavour compounds that we are most sensitive to in plant foods are breakdown products of essential amino acids that our body needs, are breakdown products of essential fatty acids that our body needs, and breakdown products of other phytonutrients like carotenoids, you may have heard of those, they're also in carrots and other foods. But the flavour compounds we are most sensitive to are, the, are really indicators for us of how healthy that food is for us. So we can smell the nutritional value of products, we're attracted to foods that actually are good for us. And I think that really is the role of flavour volatiles in food. And even though they are present in such tiny quantities in, in all sorts of different plant foods, um, they really are key to understanding um, the value for us. Here is, I've, I've done a similar um, a diagram here. I showed you, you um, wine. This one's one for meat. And I'm going to talk about meat at the conference that I'm, I'm at tomorrow. Um, this is the one for, um, for beef, as it may be. Beef is mostly water with some fat and protein. Again, less than 1% of volatile compounds in beef. Um, there are more than 880 different volatile compounds in beef. It's mostly the carbonyl and the sulfur-containing smelly compounds that we're attracted to in beef. But similarly for wine, where the volatiles are derived from precursors from region, 
With beef, the volatile compounds are also derived from precursors based on what the cow was eating, how it was treated, um, and how it was slaughtered even, and how it was treated post-harvest actually causes those flavour volatiles that, can, can, um, that we can enjoy. But certainly at this point in time, unlike the wine industry, the beef industry really don't understand or know what their point of distinction is for Australian beef. We all love Australian beef, right? It tastes fantastic. But why is it different from American beef? Why is it different from beef from South America? That's something that the industry is certainly interested in understanding and um, certainly are working with me at the moment to try and unlock um, what the flavour signature of Australian beef is. Uh, another little anecdotal piece of information is that with raw seafood um, versus cooked seafood, raw seafood has a whole lot of different flavour volatiles that are present there can, that can distinguish different species in seafood. But raw meats of different type generally all smell just like bloody raw meat. <laughs> Um, it really does, with meat, you need to cook the meat to actually elaborate those flavour volatiles and create those points of distinction, um, which is probably why we eat more um, raw seafood than we do necessarily eat raw meat. Perhaps there's other reasons there as well. Um, and certainly across the, the plant food kingdom, as I mentioned, we're attracted to, to flavours that, are, that, make, that are, uh, signify uh, nutritional and health value in those products. The reality is most of the, the taste of all of these different types of, of fruit products, they're all a bit sweet and they're maybe a little bit acidic, um, but it's the flavour volatiles which actually distinguishes the flavour, the aroma of each of these and enables us to know the difference between a lemon and an orange, for instance, if we weren't able to see the colour. I've, I've been through some of this. What influences flavour of natural foods? This is this provenance. Um, where the product has come from, the age of the product, the seasonality, um, the processing and packaging, all of those things contribute to that inter interesting flavour signature of um, Australian food products. And Champagne has done that particularly well. Over the last several years, um, I've done a lot of work in this area. As I said, I'm about to do some work in beef. Um, we've certainly looked at comparing Australian coffee and how that compares to coffees from around the world. Um, Australian seafood, specifically from the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia, Coffin Bay oysters you'd know very well. We've done some excellent work there looking at what is so different about um, oysters from Coffin Bay as opposed to oysters from elsewhere in Australia and, uh, and Tasmania oysters obviously as well. We've done some work in craft beer and understanding what the different um, regions that the grains have been grown. Is there a contribution that craft brewers can actually use um, to be able to regionally distinguish the beers that they're making and use that as a tool or a lever to add um, different flavour signatures to their beers? And most recently, I've been working with beef. Now, this is the last, and I, I hope I'm not going on too long here. Am I okay, Joel? That's okay. Oh, good. <laughs> um, the last third of my presentation, I wanted to talk to you about a very exciting project that I'm involved with, which is quite close to my heart. And um, this is a project we have in looking at uniquely Australian foods. So lots of food companies come and talk to me and wanting to find a point of difference. Provenance is part of what we're doing and understanding regional flavours. But there's actually a, a new opportunity, um, really, for, for food industries in Australia, which is starting to emerge, and that is in the use and application of Australian indigenous plant foods in mainstream food products to add a point of distinction and to increase the Australian flavour signature of these food products. Um, on top of this, we have, um, in terms of the opportunity for, na for native foods uh, that we grow in Australia, uh, worldwide, we're struggling with a lack of, of diet diversity. We really tend to, to, in many countries, eat corn and rice as, as a major staple food, but in, in many um, uh, populations around the world, we are really missing a lot of the, the nutrients, the minerals and vitamins that our bodies need from food because our food is fairly nutritionally um, deficient. And a lot of the, um, the grain products that we eat, even Australia bread, for instance, is fairly um, nutritionally 
deficient, let's just say. <laughs> we all eat the whites. Some of us eat a lot of whites. It really is the colours that, that gives more value to our food. But there's a lack of diet diversity. We also have a huge problem in Australia with food fa waste and, and, also, and also hidden hunger, and that, that um, speaks to that lack of, of the nutrients in food that we need. And this really does provide a new opportunity for Australian plant foods because they are so nutritionally dense. There's also an increasing market uh, worldwide for um, uh, functional ingredients to be used in other food products. In 2017, the US fu uh, functional food ingredient market was worth $2.5 billion, and that's, that's certainly set to increase. And this is really driven by a consumer trend where um, there is a rising incidence of chronic disease in our, in our Western populations, and we're really wanting to move towards more um, healthier choices in our food and foods that have um, more value for us nutritionally um, than we've been willing to put up with um, to date. And a new project that we've just been funded uh, through the Australian Research Council is in a training centre in uniquely Australian foods, where we're converting traditional ethnobotanical knowledge um, from Indigenous communities and Indigenous populations and turning that into branded products. And part of this project is also about um, creating sustainable livelihoods on country for Indigenous people and identifying in Australian native plant foods what's good about those foods and how they can be used in, um, in mainstream food products to add value. An excellent example of that is in the prawn industry. You may not be aware of this, but Australian farm prawns, around 80% of Australian farm prawns, are actually dipped in a, a kakadu plum solution. Um, it don't need very much kakadu plum, but it's dipped in a kakadu plum solution before they're frozen storage for then later retail sale. And that's instead of using an otherwise chemical preservative. And over six to nine months of shelf life, the value of those prawns are actually increased by $2 a kilo than, than if using a chemical preservative because the colour is retained because of the kakadu plum and the antioxidant properties of the kakadu plum, but also the fresh note of those prawns are retained. And th that industry have been able to re remove chemical use in their processing systems and used um, indigenous plant foods instead and their potent qualities to preserve those prawns. And there are so many other opportunities um, uh, that, that, um, that native plant foods really, really possess for the Australian food industry and also to allow them to add that point um, of distinction. We're working with a number of companies um, as part of this training centre, Kindred Spirits Foundation, um, Karen Sheldon Catering, who's in the Northern Territory. Um, they do a lot of Indigenous um, training. Venus Shell Systems, um, Pia Winberg, um, she produces native seaweeds and we're looking for new markets for those native, nutritionally dense seaweeds which have not otherwise been consumed. Um, the, uh, the ANFAB, who are the peak body for native foods and botanicals, and also we actually, interestingly, have a partner. You may have heard of the Flow Frame. Uh, so they, that it's a type of bee um, of hive that uh, actually can gently release the honey from the hive without disturbing the bees. And we've actually been able to demonstrate scientifically that the flavour of the, the flow frame honey retains its flavour qualities and its botanical um, origin flavour qualities compared to honeys that are spun down and heated and whatnot when they're extracted. So it's a better way of preserving those native um, flavour signatures in honey. And as I mentioned, we're working all the way from looking at um, sustainable livelihoods on country, the composition of native plant foods, um, the safety of those plant of na native plant foods, the nutritional qualities, and also looking at trademarking and benefit sharing so that everyone gets a, a piece of the pie if they turn into commercial opportunities. That's our team there. These are some of the native plant foods that we have been looking at and studying in close detail. We have Goldbarn and Jalunga, which make some beautiful teas. Um, bush tomato, which is toxic unless you harvest it at just the right time um, while well, it's quite ripe and then dry it and process it in a certain way. Um, tastes more like um, caramelised onion than tomato. 
um, saltbush, which does taste a little bit salty, of course, um, and maybe a more, um, a, a, I guess, a healthier way to add salt to your diet, to add some saltbush to get the flavour and, and the taste without all the, the um, bad things that come from having high salt. Native fruits, green plum, which you probably haven't heard much of at all, and burdekin plum. There's been precious little research done on those, uh, on those different fruits. We don't know what's so great about them. A little bit of research on green plum tells us that the protein content um, is around 12 or 13 percent, which is quite high. If you think about blueberries, it's less than half a percent protein content. Um, so actually, they're a really great source of protein. They're also super delicious. Um, we're measuring things like folate and the like in those particular products and trying to understand what's good about them and how we might use them in new food systems. The pindan walnut, which you may have heard of, and the bunya nut, which I'm sure you have heard, those massive nuts that grow out in, near the bunya mountains and at the right time of year, they drop like bombs. If you're not careful, you could get hit by them. The kakadu plum, we know a lot more about. There's a much larger body of research about kakadu plum. And as I said, its application in the prawn industry has shown some efficacy. Um, in that project, currently the kakadu plum is being wild harvested from a collective of communities across northern Australia. Um, and there, there isn't large plantations of those um, in cultivation. It really is wild harvest. But there's huge volumes that are actually able to be collected and used. And there's a lot of interest in using um, the amazing antioxidant properties of kakadu plum in a whole range of diff different products. Uh, wattle seeds are also incredibly <laughs> interesting. Uh, there are many, many different types of wattle seeds. I've tasted lots of them. Um, they range in flavour from, you know, when they're roasted, sort of the coffee and chocolatey types of notes that you have in wattle seeds, if you've ever tried any. Um, but some of them also have really herbaceous and spicy, um, spicy notes as well. There's even one that reminds me of pork crackling, <laughs> which, is, which is just delicious. So... Um, the wattle seeds we understand um, and are starting to learn more about have some um, anti-diabetic qualities, which may be really, really positive for our diets. And when incorporated into breads, um, currently Karen Sheldon Catering have, ha and through the research that we've done, have produced little um, bread rolls that are in the Qantas Club Lounge in Darwin and looking to expand there um, with Australian native wattle seeds. We're looking at understanding what's so special about honey that's made from Australian plants. And as I mentioned earlier, the seaweed project, the Australian native seaweeds we're also looking at. Uh, so all of these projects are being explored by 10 different PhD students as part of this project, um, ranging from traditional knowledge all the way through to branded products, and I won't bore you too much about those. We have about five of those PhD projects currently on board, so if anyone's considering doing a PhD, we're still looking uh, for some more candidates, so, so please uh, contact me later if you're interested. Um, um, one of the PhDs will be in sustainable livelihoods down the bottom here um, with School of Social Scientists and um, we are also uh, have a couple that are working with the law school looking at those um, benefit sharing and, and trademarking for native food products and I'm also looking for someone who is interested in, um, in understanding um, how Australian native foods are perceived uh, by our overseas target markets. Now, I think that this might be, no, no, I've got one more, and then I've got my video. I know it's going to play automatically when I press, so I've just got to be careful. A, a number of outputs and outcomes I think I've covered off on most of these. Um, we certainly are interested in Indigenous participation, and as such, we're looking at a whole lot of alternate education routes um, to be able to, to help um, in, or to involve Indigenous people in the research that we're doing. Um, and many of the, the parties that we've been speaking to and communities that we're speaking to are incredibly interested. And, um, and we'd like to see some more leadership um, in the future in this area of science. Um, one of the important outcomes, I think, that will be for our project will be developing a model by which we evaluate the opportunity of a, of a new uh, native food I guess, application, using a different value paradigm to what uh, perhaps the Western world may be using. Something that's really important to us in this project is just because a particular opportunity will make a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean that that's good for a community. It doesn't necessarily mean that the community wants that particular opportunity or is comfortable with the way that that native food is being used in, in a system. So we want to be able to understand across the board, not just economically, what the return is going to be, but are there going to be education 
outputs? Are there, is there going to be meaningful employment on country? Is it going to increase people's happiness and well-being um, by exploiting a new native food opportunity like the kakadu plum in prawns, for instance? Um, we certainly anticipate there to be a lot of opportunities to come along, um, but we want to have a um, developed a model by which to analyse that opportunity and make sure that the benefits go back to where they should do. If you want to find out more, I have a website for this uh, for our new training centre and for anyone who's interested in a PhD, I'm advertising some right at the moment. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of the training centre, but Yasmina Sultan Bawa, my colleague, is the Director and she's absolutely fabulous and would love to hear from anyone who's interested. Um, but please check out our website and you'll be able to hear more. Um, I'm not going to say anything more, I've got a little video to show you which really in a nutshell describes much of, of this new Uniquely Australian Foods Training Centre that we're involved with. Um, but if, yeah, after that I suppose if there are any questions, I think uh, this should play. Can you hear? My name is Bruno Dan. I come from the west side of Australia and I do my bush product from there. There's so much bush tuck out there. I wish to share with everyone. Australian native plant foods have been grown in extremely challenging conditions. The Australian environment is very dry and harsh, and as a consequence, these native plant foods have had to produce a whole lot of amazing phytonutrients, which are excellent for human health, but also have very different and distinctive flavour qualities. So the type of products that are involved in the project, we have divided them into different groups. For example, the native fruits, we will be looking at kakadu plum, green plum, verdigan plum, and then we look at the native herbs and spices, and then native seeds. So we're analysing the food samples, we're looking for nutrients, vitamins, is there anything special in these native samples. We're also doing studies and actually proving the bioavailability of these compounds in healthy humans. So what I bring to the training centre is I'm really aiming to bring a chemical engineering perspective to many of the products and processes that are going to be looked at within the uniquely Australian food space. And really that can come from both the processing angle but also the consumer product angle is when you start to taste and experience foods. We will be also working on what is known as innovative technologies. So for example, the Honey Project, we'll look at an, a patented technology which Australia has created and that would be a uniquely Australian product. With the growth of the human population, we're going to run into a protein shortage. Now, there's just not going to be enough red meat to feed everyone, so we've got to start looking at alternatives. Why not indigenous kangaroo and other indigenous meat types? And the idea is to look at how can we add value to these meat products to actually make them part of the Australian experience. So we're looking for anything where we can say uniquely Australian really does mean that, that it is impossible for other countries to uh, replicate what we can do here. And at the same time, we'll be also working on developing a branding and marketing strategy, so trademarks, collective marks, for uh, the, the industry to protect and ensure that what is uniquely Australian remains within the control of uniquely Australian organisations. My role in the training centre will be to work uh, with the community groups. I'm very interested in how we can work effectively in a real partnership and real collaboration, so how the scientists can work effectively with the Indigenous groups. The main areas we're focused on will be access and benefit sharing arrangements, which will be used to ensure that the collection and use of the native materials is done in an ethically and sustainable fashion. Doing what we're trying to do, it's going to create local jobs for local people on country. Um, there's very little development out there on country. Um, so, in other words, there's no opportunities to gain employment. For the enterprise, it's a regional economic development, so it's actually um, helping the community to um, be self-sustainable and um, to rely on their bush food to actually give them some money as well. Research, in a way, is a bridge between what we know and how we can use that in a commercial and contemporary context. It gives us the opportunity to look at creating not only subsistence farming, but also commercial opportunity so it can create an income from something that has always been of economic value to us as well as culturally. The Aboriginal people have been researchers for thousands of years through in innovation and testing things. So it's uh, innate, I guess, in the way that Aboriginal people um, are. 
scientifically research it's very good for us because we know what we are selling it is healthy and it's, it is um, that we actually grew up with that same food as well so it's actually much more better if we do have the scientists backing us up with our fruits as well. What Bush Tucker means to our community is not only a way of maintaining our responsibilities and our custodial responsibilities to country, but it also means that we are able to continue to enjoy the nutritional benefits of the food that is actually more suited to our biology. It also enables us to pass on cultural knowledge uh, onto the next generation about how we are responsible for those plant species. Mr Bush is so delicate and he's got a lot to offer, a lot to give. I mean, you can hold it to yourself, or you can give it and share it, and it's an awful lot to do, but it's, when you really look at it, it's really worth it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk, Heather. We're going to give you a chance to catch your breath, have a drink. Um, we're going to take questions now. So I'm sure you've got lots of food-related questions to ask. If you do, you can tweet them or you can write them down your paper, wave them in the air, and Dominic will come around and collect those now and bring me out a few of those to get started. Next month, we, of course, be back for our last talk of the year. And next month is actually a talk about snakes. I know we announced that last month, but we... Um, had a, had a slight change of schedule. So next month, we have Dr. Brian Fry from the University of Queensland. He heads the Venom Evolutions Lab. And so he is going to be talking about snake bites and snake science and what we can expect this summer. So it'll be a really great talk. It will definitely be happening next month without a slither of a doubt. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here all night. Um, all right, if we have some questions... Uh, let me go to Twitter first. So we have a question here. Yes, yes, if you want to come up onto stage. Good. Okay, let me have a quick look at one of these. Oh, okay, this is good. Um, so we have to have a couple of questions already about spicy foods yeah. Yeah. and um, how some people are more sensitive to spice than others mm -hmm. and whether that is a learned uh, learned response or uh, yeah. inherent, yeah. and what happens over time? Good. Yes, yeah, spicy foods. Yes, I should have started my children on spice much younger. I used to appreciate spicy foods at home, but I no longer have them because of my kids. Our um, ability to tolerate spice is actually something that we're habituated to. So it has a lot to do with our, our culture that we've been brought up in and the food culture of that particular family. Um, spice is actually also um, translated through um, what the mother is eating, both um, in utero, but also in breastfeeding your child, their tolerance to, to spice starts to build up if the mother is eating spicy food. Um, so that is something that you will, um, I guess, it's, it's not as though your senses are deadened over time, but your ability to tolerate hot foods certainly is built by, um, by exposure. So if you want to get into spicy foods, you need to start small, but repeated exposure can increase your tolerance. Excellent. Uh, this person, who would like to remain nameless, can't decide if they like, love or hate mango. Oh. Uh, I think the <laughs> texture and flavour combo confuses me. Why is that? Well, that's interesting. Do you know that Australian... I've done so much work on mango. Great question. Um, Another delicious fruit you just happened to have to I work have, on. I, I have. Do you know that the Australian flavour of mango is completely different to mangoes that are consumed elsewhere in the world? So that Kensington Pride, Bowen Backyard, it's all the same um, type of mango. It has this compound called alpha tapinolene that's present. It's ex extremely high concentrations, many times at sensory threshold. Um, so it's an extremely potent uh, compound when we taste it in Australian mango, and it's completely unique. Um, so mangoes from, when you make a mango chutney in Australia, like an Indian mango chutney, it isn't right because the Indian mangoes are more cucumbery in taste. So when you make a mango chutney from Australian mango with that really terpene, piney type of flavour, the, the flavour combination is all wrong. I did, did a study many years ago with the trained panel and I had a couple of panellists. We, we looked at different mango varieties um, from a breeding population that was grown up at Mareeba. And there were some varieties in there, one of 
them was, was an Irwin and a Namdok Mai. Um, the Calypso was in there, of course, which is just a baby Kensington Pride, but, but um, perhaps not quite as flavoursome. Uh, but some of my panels said, I really don't like mango, but fine, I'll, I'll be on the mango panel. But they loved the Namdok Mai mango, which is a, a, a gr long green banana-y looking mango that's sort of, um, I guess, Indonesia and Thailand is probably where it's probably more common. Um, and that mango is actually quite sweet, but it has a fairly low odour profile. Certainly none of that alpha dipinlene that our Kensington Pride has. And all of the people who are non-mango eaters loved the Namdok Mai. So... Mango ain't mango, I can tell you. Mangoes from around the world do taste incredibly different. So it probably explains someone's love-hate relationship. Fantastic. Um, well, I love them, so I'm looking forward to mango season. Uh, question about, are the Australian native foods you mentioned mm. farmed or are they gathered wild? Yeah, uh, so some are farmed. Um, so things like um, Tasmanian pepper berry and pepper leaf are farmed quite extensively in, in Tasmania. Um, lemon myrtle, anise myrtle, um, rye berries, um, or they're like a lily peri, syzygium species, um, they've all been commercialised sort of in the 70s. Uh, you know, a number of, of hippies came to Australia and really got into growing native foods and made some selections and did start growing some of those species commercially. Macadamia, of course, you will know about. That's kind of that's, um, jumped the gate. Only recently has Australia started to produce more macadamia than within Hawaii, which made macadamia famous. But so I'm glad to claim that one back home. But a lot of the other native um, species that we're looking at, so wattle seed is wild harvested. Um, definitely kakadu plum is wild harvested at this point. Um, so it's a range. And just don't think wild harvest is walking out and picking a bush here and there. Um, some of these groves in what air and some of these other regions in, in, um, in Northern Territory, Western Australia and Queensland, that there's humongous groves of, you know, I think it was 11,000 tonnes of kakadu plum was, was, was harvested this year by hand. And um, it really does bring a great economic um, resource to, to those Indigenous communities. So many of those groves, they're, they're, they might almost look like semi-commercial operations, but they weren't um, Richmond planted or anything like that. They are natural. Um, Howard asks, how does the fruit that reverses sweet and mm. sour tastes work? Miracle berries? Yes, miracle berries. So they actually block, um, uh, yeah, they block the receptors and, um, and change the way our receptors on our tongue work and, and make things taste sweet when they don't actually taste sweet. So it basically your sweet receptors here, the miracle fruit berry compound comes along and goes, activate, 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 sticks there and you can eat all these sorts of sour things and your, your brain is sensing sweet because your receptor's going off for that time until finally it lets go. And then you're back to normal. And then you're sucking on a lemon. Then you, then you really are. <laughs> Already are, something horrible. <laughs> are there any commercial applications of those berries beyond just sort of really fun parties? Or? Yeah, look, I've... Um, My party. Actually, I, I spoke to a, a lady in North Queensland um, who they're actually growing some miracle berries. And what they're actually doing with them at the moment is processing them and compounding them into tablets. And, um, and look, this is all just a bit anecdotal. I haven't got research papers on this or anything, but um, she's actually been selling them or giving them to people who are on chemotherapy. Because I don't know, um, my father was on chemotherapy and food all tasted horrible and metallic while he was on chemotherapy and really lost his love for food. Um, and of course you need to eat and, and maintain your health while you're undergoing such a strenuous treatment. But this lady claims, who's been producing these in North Queensland, that if you have the miracle berry and then go out and enjoy food, food tastes amazing again and that, and that metallic flavour goes away and that people are, are, are really coming and there's high demand for these, these tablets of miracle berry um, to actually improve their senses and their experience of taste in food while they're under treatment. Right. More um, research needed, more research needed. <laughs> Last question. Mm. Can you train yourself to like a food you hated before? I hate spam. <laughs> <laughs> I've always hated spam. And while I've tried to come at spam again, I've never been able to really tolerate spam. It is disgusting. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of foods that I, you know, originally thought I didn't like, but um, we're, 
when you work in this area and you're tasting a lot of different foods, you sort of need to put your likes and dislikes aside and think about the food analytically and consume the food um, analytically. And a lot of my panellists do do that. They have preferences, they like this or that, but they can actually still sit on the panel and tolerate eating huge amounts of papaya or whatever it is that I'm, I'm feeding them and, um, and able to think about that. <laughs> I've got one of my panellists is sitting in the front here squirming saying, that's not true, Heather. <laughs> That was too much papaya, and never did that to us again. <laughs> um, what am I saying? <laughs> spam. Spam. Back to spam. Um, yes, you can. You can uh, improve your your acceptability of a food, and my recommendation would be with repeated exposure. Um, with kids, kids are sort of born with this um, innate natural tendency to avoid new flavours and they hate vegetables because they're bitter and they won't eat this or that or the other. The truth is that it really is the lack of familiarisation that they have with those foods which causes them to reject them. If it tastes different and weird to what they, their diet normally consists of, they're instantly going to reject them. But repeated exposure um, and putting that broccoli on the plate night after night after night after night after night after night, <laughs> it theoretically, should increase that child's um, acceptance of that food product in their diet. So you can, you can get around to training yourself to liking something that you didn't previously like. So just tell your kids it's for scientific purposes. It is. <laughs> Heather said so. On that note, please join me in thanking our fantastic speakers tonight, Dr Heather Smythe. Thank you very much. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. We'll see you all back next month. Enjoy some food now. You must be hungry.